Hello, Facebook and YouTube. We on YouTube as well, Ellie? Yes, we are. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. Just making sure. Um, <laughs> We're going to get started here in just a minute or two. Excited to uh, be joined by Ken Kazak. Um, calling this the Veterans Writers Panel. This is our only our second episode uh, thus far, um, but we got some great guests lined up for tonight that I'm going uh, to have Ken introduce. But uh, as we let people into the room and get started, um, we'll, uh, we'll kick things off. Much like Thursday Night Football. <laughs> oh, no, nice recovery. Nice analogy there. <laughs> All right. I will uh, start playing the music and letting people in. Sounds great. I love behind the scenes stuff. It's always fun to be in the green room. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Veterans Writers Panel uh, with the Veterans Breakfast Club for Thursday, October 21st. My name is Sean Hall. I'm the Director of Programming with VBC. Uh, with me, as always, is our media producer, Ellie DePastino. Hi, Ellie. How are you? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks. Um, we've been having a pretty busy, solid week here with VBC. Had a wonderful conversation on Monday night happy hour uh, about the Mars uh, radio stations. That is available on our Facebook page as well as on YouTube if you check us out on either. Um, I believe Ellie has links for both of those that she could throw into the chat. And uh, this past Monday, we also posted our second part with the conversation with Army veteran Adam Zafudo. Uh, he talked mainly about his detour or his detours, his tours in Afghanistan, though he was deployed in Iraq as well. Um, but if you didn't see part one, I highly recommend jumping over to the Scuttlebutt channel of the VBC uh, page on YouTube, checking out part one there and then checking out part two. Adam had a, a lot of very interesting things to say. It was a great conversation. Um, we are continuing on with our in-person breakfasts. Uh, next one coming up this Saturday at Christ United Methodist Church in uh, Bethel Park. Uh, this will be, I think, the second time that we've been there since coming back to some this sort of hybrid model that we are doing. Uh, we will be live streaming that. So if you can't join us uh, for the in-person this coming Saturday, please feel free to join us online and you can ask questions there. We're going to be live streaming the whole thing and uh, we're looking forward to that. But uh, where we're at tonight is in the writer's room and Ken Kazak is the host of this program. We're very excited to have Ken uh, involved in this. Ken, how are you doing this evening? Good, John. Uh, good to be here. Hi, everybody. Um well, Ken, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and kick things off here. And I figured I would I would ask you, because this is only our second our second writers uh, writers panel here. Um, but I figured I'd ask you because you're a writer yourself. Uh, how did you get started in writing and, and why are you so passionate about veterans putting pen to paper and getting their stories down? Well, let me let me back up the people that know me that um, I think I've shared this story before. I'm not a veteran. I had spinal surgery when I was in high school. And when I went to enlist in the army at the federal building, it took the written test, um, did well on that and went back in the room and they give you the physical exam, the quick uh, once over. And uh, the doctor saw the scars on my back and my hip. And uh, he said, what are you doing here? Go home and do something else. And uh, I did, I went and did something else. And how I started to write was I graduated from college into the worst recession since the 1930s. No job for a guy that uh, had to take remedial math class in order to get into community college and then had a 1.6 grade point average his first semester at Duquesne and um, no jobs. And I had one suit, it was a brown double knit polyester suit and I did everything possible to get a job. I used to walk around town passing out resumes 
stood in front of the Duquesne Club, passing out resumes, every ad in the newspaper. And what ended up happening to me around November, I got a call from a company downtown and brought me in for an interview, brought me back. And I had four interviews and it's getting kind of close to Christmas. And they said they were bringing me back for another interview. Instead, I got the Dear Ken rejection letter. And by that point, I had probably received 500 re rejection letters. I knew the weight of the envelope. It wasn't going to be good news. And um, I called. I have a young lady I was dealing with in the HR department. I said, they, I was told I was coming back. She said, oh, let me take a look. Uh, she called and said, there was a mistake. Come back in for more interviews. So I had eight job interviews for a job that paid $14,400 a year. I would basically be looking at a, working at a call center. And two days before Christmas, I got another letter. I could tell by the uh, weight of the envelope, it wasn't good news. And um, the woman wrote to me, said, uh, there's no mistake this time. We're not interested in you. Please don't contact my office again. And that's exactly what I did do. I did contact her office right after Christmas. I wrote her a letter on my Smith Corona electric typewriter, and I just uh, expressed my disappointment at the way my application and interviews were handled. A job interviews for a fourteen thousand four hundred dollar a year job is a little excessive. And and Sean, when I put that letter into the mailbox at the top of Marianne Drive in Baldwin, all the anger, frustration, disappointment, embarrassment just left. It just went out, and at that point. I realized how carthetic writing can be. And it was a few months after that, I started sending letters. I, I had an interest in real estate development. I sent five letters to five real estate developers. Two weeks later, I had a job. And two months after that, I was in the Caribbean in the first of many trips to Florida. So I went to work for one of the top real estate developers in the city. I still have a connection to the family. So, um, you know, I've had 16 articles in the Post-Gazette. I've written six books. I've received two grants from the uh, PA Council uh, on the Arts. But I have to tell you, when I think about writing, I don't think about all the travels I was able to do or anything like that. I think about how carthetic writing is. So when I talk about veterans should write, especially younger veterans, they might achieve the same carthetic aspects that I did, number one. And number two, younger veterans still got their careers ahead of them. It may help them with their job skills. I have a fairly large investment practice only for the uh, fact that I was a writer first. Once I started to write and uh, achieve the objectivity that all writers need, then I was able to learn things above my level of intelligence. So the carthetic aspects came first, Sean. Then after that, uh, the ancillary benefits. And in the book, How to Be Old, there's two, there's two chapters telling everybody why they need to write. The ancillary benefits are numerous. Uh, better time management, listening ability, better reading comprehension. I've got the greatest BS detector in the world all because I was a writer first. So anyway, that's, that's why I originally contacted Todd. And by the way, just to share this story, uh, Sean, I don't know if I ever did. So th this, this is the first book I ever wrote, How the Investment Business Really Works. It's gonna be updated. How to Be Old is going to be a three-part series. And I'll tell you this. Um, I had this book. It was in bookstores. And I used to get my split from the distributor and the bookstore owner. And, you know, the light bulb went off one day. And I said, you know what? Maybe I should just give this book to people and I'll get some clients. And I did. I, I literally got millions of dollars of clients' money because of that book. And those people have been my clients for a long time. And, uh, you know, I continue to write and teach people how the investment business uh, really works. So that's that's why I'm, I'm a proponent of writing, that everybody should be writing. Well, that's great, Ken, thank you. And do you wanna uh, go ahead and uh, introduce our guest for tonight? Well, I'm gonna introduce our guest, but this is kind of ironic. I see Bob the Vortex on the call and Bob was a, a great writer at the Post-Gazette. Um, uh, there was an article in the Post-Gazette today about the Pittsburgh Condors did anybody uh, in Pittsburgh happen to see the article online? Because there's kind of a, there's going to be a similarity or a connection here. The article was about the Pittsburgh Condors playing against the Milwaukee Bucks who had won the NBA championship. 
And the Milwaukee Bucks had a guy named Lou Alcindor who was going to change his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And in the article, the Condors sold tickets saying Lou Alcindor is going to be playing here tonight. And two hours before game time, the Milwaukee Bucks decided to sit him down. So he didn't play. So here's the connection here. We were going to have uh, some individuals who have written books. I know that we had Matterhorn up there, but Carl Merlantis is not here tonight, scheduling conflict. We can try to get him for the next time we do this. And I'm waiting for, um, uh, you know, um, Jack McLean to uh, step up there. I don't know that he's going to be here either. So um, anyway, what we're going to do here this evening then is we're going to talk to the gentleman, the architect of the book, uh, LZ Sitting Duck, um, uh, the battle for FSB are gone. So that's going to be Thomas. And uh, Thomas, could you unmute and uh, be interviewed, please? Hey, Ken, how are you doing? Good, good. Okay, so... Um, well, let, let's circle back here to, to, to Jack because I really enjoyed uh, uh, Loon also. But um, so just just to give the quick background, we were on you were on uh, the VBC before with John Arsenault. And I believe did you bring somebody else on when you yeah, were on? Rick Everton actually is that on the call tonight. And uh, I, I see actually... he's in the book, too. So but I guess I guess when you were talking, I get it didn't really sink into me the the um the project itself and the the battle itself but once i read the book i mean oh, just just uh uh just tremendous so i'm glad rick's here because he has a chapter in the book so let me start with with you and this is going to be your um your your hour so um let this set the stage here so lz stands for landing zone argon do you know where the name came from argon Argonne was a uh, World War I battle. So that's how they got the name Argonne for the hill. Because remember back right around the time frame was it, and they first started calling them landing zones. Then after a certain time frame, they started calling them fire support bases. So uh, Argonne was a hill that was, they, it was otherwise known as 1308. It was probably the second furthest uh, site that we occupied to the DMZ. The next one would have been 1154, which uh, was about a mile, a little over a mile away from Argonne, north of it. So these two hills were the remote uh, sections that- of did, that, that did, that other hill, did that other hill have a name also? Uh, I can't remember. I just remember it was 1154 is what it was called. But okay, so just, it, but. just to paint a, a geographical picture here. So Argonne was in the um, upper the, northwest corner of South Vietnam. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. And it was also near Laos. I mean, it was what, just 2000 meters from the Laos? Border? Less than that. Let, well, I've been to Vietnam five times, uh, like for the research of my book. And it's basically maybe like 1500 meters, you can see it. You can see the Laotian border and Laos from where you stand at an Argonne there, you can see it. Okay, That's so I, I, know, I know that Argonne was important because of the, um, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That's in other correct. words, in other words, it needed to be, the Ho Chi Minh Trail needed to be protected. That's why the NVA wanted it and the United States could cause damage to the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That's why they wanted it. Yeah, and what it was is that, you know, the NBA were, funnel, were shuttling down all their supplies through the trail. And at nighttime, the guy said that you could see the reflection of the headlights of the, of the trucks the NBA were using, the Soviet trucks, obviously. You could see the reflection in the, in the sky of them coming down the trails there. And you could see, like, the lanterns they were holding. It was, you, you could see that at night. So just to go back, though, I know the U.S. controlled the hill in November of 68. That's correct. correct. They gave correct. it up. Um, and they Carl, Carl Melanis' uh, Charlie company built the, the base in end of like November, early December of 68. So that's Carl's connection to the hill. Uh, Charlie company 
set up the base, cleared it, and controlled it till the mid of December of 68, then they abandoned it. And the base was supposed to have been, you know, artilleried and, you know, knocked out after that, but unfortunately it wasn't. But uh, when the uh, battle in night, March of 69 happened, the bunkers and everything were pretty much still intact when the, when they landed. Right. They were, it was like nothing. It was just like the day. They well, I'm going to get, I'm going to get to that point in a moment here, but now for you personally, mm -hmm. okay. You're the, I'm calling you the architect of this book. Okay. <laughs> How did you hear about this story? Um, what it was is uh, growing up, I'm, I'm 45, but uh, growing up, we had like a close family friend that was uh, killed. Uh, March 22nd of six, March, I'm sorry, yeah, March 22nd, 1969. And you always heard these stories about the individual, the book, about, you know, just how he was as a, as a person. And, you know, you, you really wouldn't believe it if you heard the stories, like he was kind of like a modern day Davy Crockett or a Daniel Boone, because uh, David in the book, uh, he had a pet black bear as a kid. He had horses, he had deer. Uh, he, you know, he was just he holds he held track records that are still held to this day by him. We're talking, you know, 50 some he graduated in 67, 66, and there's still track records that are held by him. And he was a tall, husky, uh, Scandinavian ancestry background. Uh, so I always heard these, you know, growing up as a kid, my family would and relatives would always talk stories about him and, you know, kind of talk about what he did and make you laugh. So that kind of got me interested in like, well, how did, you know, we went to the Vietnam wall when I was in like 1986, it was. And I remember looking, you know, my mom going to the wall and we, I, you know, scratched the name and all of the things. So that kind of intrigued me to figure out just who this guy was. Right. Let me, let me jump in here real quick. So the, the gentleman you're talking about, his name is David Ovis. And That's just correct. as you said, like, you know, six foot two, 200, and, I don't know, 30 pounds. His picture's in the book. I mean, it's a yeah. guy you'd like to have on your football team. And he didn't smoke, uh, drink, or swear. He just was like the cool guy, you know? And uh, everybody wanted to have him uh, as a radio opera. So, so that's how you got interested in Argon is through David Ovis. Okay, now, yeah, my comment to you then, and I, I, I think David's a threat because he's mentioned in many of the... The, yes. The, the book. Yes. Okay. So, so then when did you get the idea? Hey, let me find people who are connected to Argon and ask them to write chapters. Did, at the time, did you think it was going to be a book? Did you just say, let me just see if I can find these people? At, at first it was because, you know, all of David's family is deceased and, and back in my area, no one really knew whatever happened to him. So it was kind of like a personal enrichment for my family and everything to find out the, you know, the missing pieces of the puzzle. So I want to say right around the early 2000s, you know, when the internet was just in its infant stage, I started, you know, looking at battles of everything. And I can, you can never really find the exact battle. It just said location, Quantry, Providence, so-and-so, you know. So I found that he was at Quezon for the, the siege and Operation Pegasus and everything like the everything that was in Tyler on Quezon. So I ended up finding this one website and it had some names of some guys and it linked his uh, unit that he was with. So I reached out to a guy by the name of Larry Deason and called him. And he was shocked because for 50 years, he's been wanting to find out more about the guy that he trained and was his buddy. And when he, when I called him, I remember him, you know, afterwards he told me, he's like, yeah, I got, you know, when you called me, he said, I was like, who is this guy that really wants to know about some guy that I'm curious about? And I want to know as well. So it, it kind of mushroomed out. It, Larry's like, contact this guy, contact this guy. So it, it kind of, it kind of mushroomed out, like, you know, branched out like a tree. Okay. So, let me, so then you, how did you contact these people via email letter? Were you able to get phone numbers? And then at that point in time, did, did you, um, was your, was your first contact with them? Did you say, Hey, why don't you write a chapter about your experience? No, no, actually, um, they had a database, a roster and it had their contact information. So I reached, I usually sent by via email 
and then I would, you know, go to foam. And that was in the early 2000s. So I kind of took a break a little bit as my career progressed and had other interests that took over. But I didn't really start writing the book until about 2019. And that's how I really got the momentum to go. But prior to that, I went to Vietnam. Like that was my, and that was around 19 was like my fifth, fifth trip because I couldn't go in 20 because of COVID. But um, I did my research. So I, I figured I'd go to the area, precise area where this battle took place to help me understand uh, what I was going to write about to give me that firsthand account, kind of like right. the truth. Wait, I, I got to jump in. You didn't, you didn't ask people to start writing until 19? Oh, 2019. Wow. Yeah. That, that, was, that was rapid for a book that was published this year. Good for you. But here's the thing that I'm, I'm really curious about. Did you, did you tell them what to write about? Did you give them any suggestions as to the length of I their did. chapter or anything like that? I did. And the thing to realize is like, um, you know, a lot of this is stuff that they had built up for over 50 years. And they, the way I approached it was, is how I basically told each guy that how um, I would like you to tell me your story from the day you were told you were going to Argonne and everything, you know, from day one to the last day you were there. So, and what I would do is I either gave them a, uh, I said, if you're comfortable in writing uh, as a Microsoft Word document, that's, that's fine. Or if you prefer, I'll give you a voice recorder. And I put little instructions, how to like hit play, record, how to stop everything. And a little sheet that would say, you know, here's what I'm looking for. If you, and, and, and the guys were, a lot of the guys were adamant to actually talk about their story instead of writing it down. Right. So what I did was I, I had this uh, software you can get online uh, to transcribe the voice to text. Now it's not perfect. So you got to keep going over it and over it and over it because some of the words won't translate. But that, because before I was doing it, like I would hit stop, play, stop, play, stop, play. And it was just so time consuming. So that's when I found the software to do it. And that really sped things up. Um, so let me, let me do this. Let me just so I can stay on my point here. So you have 22 chapters in the book, 22 participants plus yourself. And by the way, I see Jim Roberts is up there and, and Jim wrote his book. It was like a series of, he referred to my short stories, I call essays, but that's a <laughs> cool way to write a book. What you did is also a cool way to assemble a book. So, um, so here's what I've, um, was wondering as I was preparing here, how many people did you actually contact? I actually contacted, I would say maybe about 50. Wow. Wow. Well, you got to remember kind of thing too. It's like how some of these guys were at the first 1968 uh, time when they when we occupied Argonne and they were able to tell me like, Hey, I know this guy, he was there the time frame you're looking for. So, you know, another guy that was crucial to this was Harold Wilson. He was in, as I mentioned in my beginning of my book, the most photographed Marine in Vietnam, as I said, because it seems like every time you saw a picture of a, of, of a battle, there was Harold. And he was instrumental to this because he could tell me, hey, I know Wayne, Wayne Markson. He was there and I got a hold of Wayne. Wayne wrote a heck of a chapter. Uh, he was Alpha Company in the book. Uh, so, and it just really mushroomed out because the guys in one of the, one of the, I will say the most interesting and most comical thing I would say for me was, is when I'd reach some of these guys, I, I explain what I'm doing. Some of the guys would ask me, well, so what platoon were you in when you were there? So I'd have to say I wasn't even born. So, so it kind of, it kind of takes them back a little bit. It's like, okay, why is this young guy writing about a battle that he wasn't in, but I would explain my connection to it. So that would allow them to understand uh, just what and, I'm doing. And, and it, it was, I always, I consider David Ov Ovis to be one of two threads. I'll get to the other, the second thread in a moment. But when they wrote about it, everybody wrote about him with glowing uh, affection for, for him. Was there anybody that just said, 
just not interested. Don't call me again. Uh, I don't want to talk about this at all. I had one guy who at first was just, he was a replacement. He was only there for a couple of days. He expressed great interest, but when push came to shove, he kind of, he kind of backed out of it. Right. Um, however, though, I will say I, after the book was published and word of mouth was getting out about it, I actually had individuals that were there contact me and say, boy, I wish I would have contributed or I just heard about it. So if I was to do a revision, I would have to add their stories because some of these guys were crucial in the battle. And, but I only had one guy tell me that, no, he didn't want to participate because he backed out of it. But um, some of the guys, um, they, they could add data, but it's just some of their chapters weren't very long because you got to remember these guys were taking artillery and mortars Right, and you get you get concussion, and not only from this battle, but from previous battles. So, lot, these guys got a lot of concussions. So, it, you know, their memory gets jarred, and you got to remember they might say, "Oh, it was at this battle, or it could have been at that Alpine, actually." So, right. they get mixed up a little bit. So, you really got to pick and choose. Right, understandable. Now, here's what I. So, you sent out your tape recorders to people. You told people to write this. Were you worried that nothing was going to come in the mail? I was, I really, well, the thing was, is like, I had to set a hard deadline and say like, Hey, you either get it in by this time or I got to move forward. And I really, I don't really want to, because I want your feedback. So, um, it was, it was, it was, it was nerve wracking at times because it's like, once you're in the flow of writing, you want to keep going. But when you hit a stop point, you're like, you're, you're kind of like, okay, you get writer's block, I guess is what I would have for a little bit until I got more information in and I could just keep going then. So did, did anybody's chapter not make it? Yes, there was a couple guys because they, were, they, were, they really weren't like uh, added value, I guess. And I, don't, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to offend them, but I mentioned them in the book. But um, I wanted consistency. And if you notice in the book, you don't see any like finger pointing like how, uh, officers against the enlisted or enlisted against the officers making harsh criticism or feedback because what this book really showed is like it's basically a band of brothers that they all know each other or know of each other and they all got the funny stories to tell you like ask this guy about this one time or you know vice versa it's a, right. it's a, a group of guys that came together who still to this day, a lot of them talk to each other, but also I've also reconnected some of the guys together cool. that haven't talked to each other in over 50 years, which is, is has been, uh, I felt it was really good for me to do. So then you, you had assemble 22. That's so correct. Me, like how that, that, that was a tough part. Like it who was, goes, was, who goes first, who's number seven like that. Well, what I, what John and I did was we tried to assemble the book, like make it flow, like from the very beginning, like how the battle was ramping up, how right. it happened, how it occurred. And then the flow of the battles from beginning to the end is what we tried to do because some of the guys were there a couple, not the act, at the actual landing. They landed day two or three later, but I try to get the, that's the way I try to make the chapter flow. And if you notice at the very end of chapter, I put uh, Sue Sargent, who is the daughter of the lieutenant colonel who was killed, the, the CEO of the battle. And mentioned in about four or five chapters that, that you know, people witnessed. Yeah. And what it yes. was is I, you know, and, and like I said once, like when you write stuff like this, it's like a car accident. If you have six people witness it, you're going to get six different stories. And they were even standing right next to each other or five feet apart because they're so you really wanted to get everyone's perspective on just what they saw, because, you know, even though this one of the guys said like Bill Black in the chapter, he was on a different side of the hill compared to Marcelino or Jesse in the book. They were totally different sections. And a lot of times those guys did not know what was going on that side of the hill, because this hill was basically the, it's like the shape of a peanut, but it's less than a football field. So and they had an upper landing zone and a lower landing zone. So a lot of these guys did not know what was going on one side of the hill versus the other. Right. Well, when you mentioned the upper, the upper LZ, so the second thread is that helicopter. Yes. That was disabled in the, in the, I guess it was the fan 
uh, tale was it, just what it, what it, what it was is that helicopter was only wasn't even a month old. It was still a brand new Huey that inserted a uh, recon team. Well, the hill was supposed to have been empty, but when they landed, the NBA were still there. Right, they were they were still in the crawl spaces that were still there. Nothing ever touched them. And a NBA soldier walked up to the pilot, the front of the nose, and shot the helicopter up, killing the pilot, wounding the co-pilot. And they were eventually uh, they they fought their way till they were um, uh, taken off the hill. And that's when the first battalion, fourth Marines, went into the hill to knock them off the hill. Is what they did. But if, but I probably five or six of the um, Marines saw that. That was what they commented about as they were coming in on their helicopter. Yeah, they all recall, because the helicopter actually was still running. It was, yeah. it, the blades weren't, tur- the blades were very slowly yes. turning. But it wasn't until uh, uh, her peer pan and another uh, uh, Marine Corps uh, private or Lance Corporal took his trenching tool and smashed the fuel lines to kill the engine and which stopped it. But, you know, as I said, that was a brand new Huey. It wasn't even a month old. Right. So now you've gotten the book together. I'm, and at the end, uh, I'm going to get back to some of the uh, interesting things you did at the end. Um, I was thinking how important the ending is of any <laughs> writing project. But so you get this book together mm-hmm. and um, did you edit it or did you hire a professional editor to go through uh, all the all the text? So what I would do is, uh, of course, I, you know, I had John as a co-author as well. And right. Was, John was at the battle. And how chapter was, nine, he's also chapter, the author of chapter nine. I stood with Marines. Yes, correct. Correct. So what it was is uh, uh, when I first started it, when I got a hold of John, he, he was kind of hard to get. He, he was kind of like Mark, a guy by the name of Mark Abelap, who went they went to basic training together. Uh, turned me to John and said, hey, get a hold of this guy because he was there as well. So John was a little hard to get, you know. He would he would answer the phone sometimes and he wouldn't, and then he finally figured, all right, this guy must be legit. So John wrote his chapter, and he ha- John had this bottled up for so many years he wanted to talk about this, and he never really had the opportunity to. So once he got this chapter done, he reached out to me and said, he says, you know, I really got to do this and he wanted to know if I, he could help. So I, I said, yeah, of course. And so both him and I did the editing. We would send chapter back, back and forth email or send it to other people to take a look over. And then we did the very rough editing and then the publisher supposedly did the rest. So let me ask, said, let me ask you, the, I, I, cause, so, you know, there's many ways to publish now, thanks to Amazon's KDP, but That's how correct. did you find this publishing company? I actually, um, I tried two companies actually before. I sent it to one. They, they turned me down and said, no, we're not interested. I was like, all right. So I went to another publisher and they said, yeah, well, we, we like what you see. And, you know, they would, they told me what they were, what they wanted. They said, well, we got to have at least uh 60,000 words, uh, you know, you do all the editing, you, you do everything, and then just give it to us, we'll put it together. So I was like, I had to do all the legwork. So I was like, well, that's not very fair. So John actually found this, the publisher, and they, they offered us a package, and we went with it. And they said that they would do the editing. They actually even made us a promotional video, which you can see on YouTube. If you type up LZ Sitting Duck, you'll see a promotional, like a minute and a half long video they made for us. Right. Um, they made us like a, a sales brochure. They um, packaged it for us and uh, pretty much the rest was history. Now, I, John and I still own the copyright to it, though we didn't sell the copyright. So we still own the copyright of the book where we can, so did you, we don't like. Did you, did you, sorry, I didn't step on you, but did you get library sales um, where um, it was in bookstores? Is it just available through Amazon? No, it, you can get it on Amazon. Yes. Um, it's in Barnes and Noble is hard to crack because um, uh, what was the gentleman that was uh, the SOG guy, the special force? John Meyer. Guy? John Meyer. Yeah. 
and he, he's right. Barnes and Noble is, is not very friendly. Um, you have, it's, it's a process to get in with them. Um, they, they stock the book in their warehouses or inventory. So if you were to go to their Barnes and Noble, ask for it, they'll say, yeah, we'll get it in a day. Um, it's really hard to get in unless you're a, have an agent and you know, you're the Grove Atlantic or someone like that, then yeah, then you're going to get put in the system into their bookstores right away. However, uh, I was at a Barnes and Noble like two a week ago and I, the manager was there and I told him I had a book that I wrote and he had told me, he says, Hey, I like supporting local authors. I'm going to actually order from the distribution center of five year books to put in the store here. And he helped me out. So sometimes it's best to even go to the bookstore and introduce yourself because sure. that might help you get, but as far as sales, it's available on Amazon. Uh, it's available, you know, uh, you, you I actually have some, you've got, you have good numbers, uh, rankings on Amazon, by the way. That's, uh, yeah, when it first came out, it was, uh, number one for about two weeks under new releases. Right. Uh, lately it's been the Kindle. I will say one thing, the Kindle is it counts as sales. Your Kindle is your biggest seller. Um, believe it or not, uh, everyone's gravitating towards the digital age. Now the, the Kindle is rock solid. Your, your hard covers are more like your uh, gifts to people or, uh, you know, coffee table books. The paperback sells pretty good. Um, we're also, I also have a uh, audio book that's going to be out probably about a month and a half. Um, I was able Wait, to, if you uh, did an audio book, do you have different people reading each chapter, like different characters? No, believe it or not, I was actually able to get a gentleman by the name of John Barrymore. Oh, that's what we, okay, yes, yes. Yeah, John Barrymore, who is a wizard at theatrical, uh, right. he, he's good friends with Rick Everington. So uh, I was able to have uh, John do the voice for all the guys. And he, you can hear his, it's not a, a melancholy type voice. It's, he really gets into it. And um, it, 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 some of the samples that I've heard are, they're, they're pretty darn good. I have to cool. admit I want to I want to talk to Rick here because I, I didn't realize he was going to be here. This is a nice surprise, but um, <laughs> I have to just go back to John. And when John was on before, yeah, right, maybe I was just halfway listening. And John talked about working in the oil fields in Alaska That's and correct. then coming back to the uh, lower 48, as they said. But he said his participation in the book. And this is when my ears picked up was Carthetic. Because it's a word that I use all the time and I say all the time. But his chapter, when when he gets off the helicopter and the lieutenant says the NVA are on top of the hill, all he heard was top of the hill. He starts running up the hill right into the fire and he, he's on the ground. They shoot his boot heel off. I mean, it's and then he kills five NVA laying on the ground with his rifle. I mean, it's just... You know, got to remember. You got to remember too. Is also in that uh, John. It, he it was thirty days. He had to go out his uh, b- uh, soulless boot. He walked for for thirty days without that. But when he exited the helicopter, a gentleman by the name of Ralph Da Silva, uh, when when uh, John went left and uh, Ralph went right, Ralph got shot. And um, it uh, to this day, Ralph Ralph survived. But he's had a, he had a heck of a time, uh, you know, because he's had so many surgeries, and we were going to try to get him to uh, contribute, but it was a little bit too much for him. So, so but 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 um, John's just those, you know, um, what are we talking about? March twentieth, nineteen sixty nine, in nineteen days. But everything that happened to him um, in that time period, he had that. In, Explain to me again, what does LAWS stand for? Laws, that's a light, light anti-tank weapon. Right, so he shoots it twice and he overshoots the bunker. He's shooting that. Later, these guys see him and they go, hey, good shooting. He shot into another bunker and took it out. I mean, it's just, you know, it's like one of those football plays where the quarterback throws it to one guy and another guy catches it, uh, overthrows and the other guy catches it. But uh, um you know, and you mentioned Ralph. I know that John 
wrote that section where he was walking point in that riverbank. And obviously who wouldn't be scared? And Ralph came up and walked with him. And like yeah. John said, never would forget Ralph uh, um, for doing that. By the way, and, and did you know why John didn't wear the helmet? There was several guys that, well, there are several guys that wouldn't wear the helmet. Like in the, in the book, you got a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Cluck. Right. Uh, Jimmy Cluck was an interesting guy. He was a short, stocky guy. He, he never really wore a helmet. His uh, 45 holster, he cut the top off and he would put a, like a transistor radio in there. And Jimmy was, uh, uh, he was fearless when it came to uh, combat. He, it, he was like a whole different person. And if it wasn't for Jimmy Cluck, a lot of these guys, such as J.P. Young, Bill Black, they owe their life to Jimmy because he kept them alive because Jim would, did three tours in Vietnam. And he, he basically taught them everything to survive. And, 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 and even in this horrific battle that was going on, I, I, I don't want to use the word humor, but I just, I had a smile when um, John is getting onto the helicopter and J.P. Young had vision problems. He kept he breaking his glasses. So the doctor says to uh, John, hey, I've got J.P.'s glasses. And uh, John says, oh, give them to me. I'll give them to him. And he puts them in his pocket. And later when he sees JP, it's nighttime. They're prescription sunglasses. And, and JP <laughs> yeah. goes, what am I going to do with these? I mean, and, uh, just in the um, worst and, of and times I, possible, just, you know, something like that happens. And as I mentioned, you know, the book really is about a, a band of brothers Vietnam style because you hear a lot of these guys can tell you some pretty short, funny stories about each other. Not only about Argonne, but battles prior to right. that they were in. But Argonne was really a battle that really bonded them together, I guess, because you got to remember this hill was the NBA had this hill zeroed in. Sure, sure. They, 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 they were masters with mortars. They, they, they knew this hill, they, every inch by inch. So to be, a, and that's how the, the book took its name because the joke was when they says, oh, you're going to Argonne. You know, it was the, the general consensus was like, you're going to a LZ sitting duck because the NBA had that hill. They knew every square inch of it. Well, that, that, the, the last point here before we get over to Rick is when they went back after November or December of 68, this is March of 69, mm -hmm. a, a lieutenant said, put the mortars in the same position that we had them before, which the yeah. gun pits, the North Vietnamese knew exactly where they Oh yeah, they were. Yeah, they, I mean, they, that was they just knew, that, they knew. Yes. Yeah. So um, anyway, you, you did an uh, excellent job of uh, putting this together. Um, I want to talk to Rick before I come sure. back to you, Tom, because I have some questions sure. about how you ended the book. So um, Rick, uh, you don't see him on the screen there. Oh, there he is. Beautiful. There. So, um, hey, Rick, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. How about you? Oh, uh, excellent. Thanks. Thanks for being here tonight. So um, your chapter is, um, it's not Argonne. It, it, it was from your experience at Alpine? Yeah, it's a hill. It's a hill uh, very close to Argonne. I, I had gotten wounded pretty bad, actually, on March 9th. And the Argonne battle was March 20th. So I got medevaced out earlier. So, but uh, the guys that uh, basically saved my life got killed on Argonne, and I never got a chance to thank them. And so I wrote chapter 13. Uh, you know, they couldn't write their chapter, so I did. Right. I'm, I'm glad you did. And I could tell right when I started that you're a man of, uh, of uh, <laughs> intelligence and, and uh, command of words. This is the way you started it. I don't. Uh, you, you know, you had wounded. You you started your chapter uh, when when you were wounded. So before this chapter, like what other writings have you done, or uh, had you done? Not that much. Not okay. really. But like, I, but but I've uh, I've written you know not extensively, but uh, uh, quite a bit on different things. You know, but never like uh, 
anything like this. But but it, it had to be such a part. I mean, you had to be, I don't know, thinking about it or just, I use the word incorrectly here, download the story. Just, you know, yeah, yeah, get yeah. it down it was the all, paper. It was, it, you're right. It, it was all there already. And I was wanting to write it for a long time about these guys that basically saved my life. And uh, uh, I always felt bad that uh, nobody ever know, nobody knows about them. So when I heard about Thomas's book, I, I said, well, I'll just uh, do a chapter about the guys that died on Argonne. And that's my connection to the, to the battle. So Alpine was, Alpine was that close to Argonne? Oh yeah, yeah. It was like a, it was like a maybe a couple thousand meters. I mean, like in ter- the timing, like th- three weeks, a month before, two months before. Oh uh, well, uh, the the we uh, we, we um, occupied Alpine uh, for quite a while, and then from Alpine we we t- uh, we did uh, operations all around the Argonne Valley looking for um, weapon stashes and stuff like that. And uh, so we would like find uh, all kinds of stuff that they like uh, uh, store and we blow it up. So that's what, that's what our mission was. We were, we were, we were looking for stuff that they packed in and then we blow it up in, on patrols and stuff. And we do ambushes and stuff from Alpine. And Argonne was like Northwest of us that that I was on uh, in November, December, when we were there the first time, I was there with Delta Company. And uh, we uh, took a lot of uh, casualties up there when I was there the first time. And they decided that because it was so zeroed in by the heavy artillery, that we weren't, it wasn't worth staying there. It was impossible to supply. You know, you know what I'm saying? You can't, you can't supply the place because they will knock all the choppers down. So it was like impossible to uh, get water, ammo or anything. So they said we weren't gonna go there anymore. But things things changed months later. So that wasn't uh, part of my pay grade to figure out to go up there. But um, I think it was uh, a mistake, but it wasn't any bigger a mistake than Vietnam in general. So I, I don't have anybody to blame personally. So I, I appreciate your, uh, your your candor, but when you decided to write this, did you, are you uh, I'm an outline guy. Were you an outline guy or did you just start writing? Because you have uh, a unique, you have no, a unique I had, I, I had, I had, I had, a, I had an outline. Cool. I had an ending and I had a beginning and I, I had uh, people I wanted to give a shout out to basically. And I wanted to put down a few thoughts about like incidences and like you said it's, it, it turned out to be cathartic so it, I, I wrote more than I thought I was so it, yeah it, it really helped so did it did it open up um, interest in writing something else yes it, well I've been trying to write this other book about this other battle uh, LZ Loon um, that's uh, already been written about but I wanted to do a write a uh, write a um, Either a novel or a short story about the guys I knew that died on LZ Loon, which were which, which was actually more guys died on it. It was about the same fierceness and the same outcome. You know, there was a huge battle. We stayed on the hill and then we left because it was uh, it was uh, impossible to stay because it was always going to be uh, heavily mortared and artillery. You know, like you can't just sit there and be uh, bombarded doesn't make any sense. Plus the, the guns were coming from Laos and we're not allowed to shoot into Laos because Laos is a different country. You understand? They can sit there with their artillery and hammer us all day long. We cannot send jets, we cannot fire at them, but they can fire at us. Same thing with Argonne, they can shoot across the Laotian border and hammer us, but we are not allowed to shoot into Laos because it's a different country. You can't shoot into somebody else's country unless you're at war with them, you understand? Yes. But the Vietnamese didn't have that issue. Right. So that, I mean, that's... It's impossible yeah. to win. You can't yes. win a war like that. No. So, well, listen, I, I wish you a, a thanks again for coming here. Um, I'm going to go back to Thomas quickly and just 
um, finish off uh, the Argon before we move on here. But best of luck on your new novel or book uh, that you're working on. So I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and, and uh, thanks again. So Thomas, just to wrap up here um, with Argon, I like what you did at the end of uh, your 22. So Jim Berg was a uh, helicopter pilot. And some of the some of the Marines told stories about how these helicopters, they didn't touch down. You, you're four feet off the ground. You jumped out or sometimes the, the back wheels were on the ground, but the front wheel was over a, over a cliff. So Jim Berg, did he did he transcribe the cassette? Jim Berg recorded a cassette for his parents. Yeah, what it right, was right after uh, Argon was over. No, actually, it was when Jim Berg made a voice recording. Uh, during the time that he was, he landed in the Argonne on the, on the first day, on the 20th. He made that recording that he sent to his parents. And it's never been, I, I transcribed it to paper for the first time. Right. And I kind of, Jim lives, Jim lives not too far from, from me. And uh, I give him a hard time because in his chapter, he talks about how he had the tough life of not having any like, hot water, I think it was. So I give, him a, I give him a little slack for that. So, but if you, if you listen to his chapter, he talks about how, you know, when they flew into Oregon, they told him, you know, if you, if you see movement, if, you know, so many meters out to your left or to your right, it's not us, it's them. Right. And see, Jim, Jim flew all they, those guys flew the 46 all throughout the Northern I-4. And a lot of times these guys, you know, the helicopter pilots didn't know the name of the hill. It, it was just a dot. They got their marching orders from like Dong Ha or Da Nang or Fu Bai and said, you go here, you go there. They just never really paid attention to the names because they, they flew into so many hills. But when you talk to Jim, uh, I would, I, you know, I asked him, I was like, you know, how, what was probably one of the worst ones that you flew into? And, and Jim got shot down a couple of days afterwards, uh, you know, from Argonne. And he had said Argonne was probably one of the worst that he flew into. Um, he was the only helicopter pilot I could get to come forward other than uh, Dale Riley. Well, before we go to Dale, before we go to Dale, just uh, I, I love the fact that you included these guys because how important they were. But just in Jim, if I get it right, Jim, Jim flew with the helicopter pilot that was chasing OJ Simpson. Do I have that correct? I, I think it was. Chuck, Chuck Paraguay was his name. Yeah, he was the guy yeah. that, you know, brought that to the world. But Dale Riley's number t- chapter 21. And yeah. I think it's titled, um, did I make a difference or if only I yeah. knew, I didn't, you know, but yeah. you're telling me Dale Riley's from Pittsburgh? He is. He's from Pittsburgh. So and yeah. again, another helicopter pilot who just. He, Dale was a crew chief. Dale was a crew chief. Okay. So, okay. So he's on the, but he's on the copter though, right? He's on the. Yeah. He was, okay. he was on a different squadron than Jim, but uh, Dale talks about just flying into Argonne because most of the time Argonne was quiet. It was the guys would describe it as Boy Scout camp, quiet, peaceful. But until a helicopter came in, right. everything in the valley opened up on them. And like Rick was saying, the hill was pretty impossible to supply because even back in well, the first time they were there in 68, they had a uh, bulldozer that they tried bringing in and it was taking so much fire that they just dropped it and it rolled and landed on the side of the hill. And Wayne Markson remembers in 1969 patrolling by it where it was just laying upright on the side of the hill uh, where the NBA stole everything that they could off it, but it's just laying there. But yet, if you read the book, how like JP Young, when he left, they were going to bill him $70 because he didn't turn it in the, the right M16. But yet you had this bulldozer laying on the side of the hill. What about that one, you know? But, uh, you know, when, when um, Rick made comment to it and some of the writers did too, some of the other writers, that they were trying to um, parachute pallets full of supplies. Correct. Right? Food, water, ammunition. And it brought back the scenes in the movie A Bridge Too Far when yeah. some of those parachutes went yeah, into elsewhere. NVA uh, territory. And at one point in time, because of the, the, the size, the aperture of the mortar, the NVA could use American shells, but not That's the other correct. way around. So it's very possible the NVA were, pardon me? They were 82 millimeter and we, ours were 81s. Right, so they were able to go there. So 
Anyway, I, I want to move on here to um, uh, another form of writing um, that um, I have an affinity for. But again, thank you for putting your book together and uh, thank you for participating. And um, hopefully Rick can come back when he gets his next uh, next book done. So thank you. OK, so, um, you know, we're going to go talk to uh, we're going to talk to uh, Alan. Um, uh, field now, and I don't see Ellen on here. He was here. Oh, Ellen's still there. Could you unmute Alan? I'm here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you for participating here. So um, for those that don't remember, uh, Alan was on the call that we had about the Ritchie boys. Alan's father was a Ritchie boy, correct? Yeah, that's correct. And his father's name is, is George, I assume? Right. Okay, so let me just go back here for a brief moment. Um, when I started to write uh, out of my anger, I wrote motion picture screenplays. And I tell people the hardest format to write is a motion picture screenplay. The reasons are, number one, you can't write in the first, second, or third person. The screenplay format is unique to itself. And the length is, is finite. It's 110 to 120 pages in proper screenplay format. Yet you can have a novella, 95 pages. Uh, the Fountainhead is 793 pages uh, in hard copy. So you wrote a screenplay about your father's experiences and you did a great job. So I just want to talk briefly. So you're trained as, you're an attorney, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and you've written before, but um, you didn't go to screenwriting class, I assume. No, right. no. So, so how did you learn to write a screenplay? Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Alan J. Field, and um, basically, I, I actually live uh, in D.C., outside of D.C. right now. But basically, uh, you know, I had started, <laughs> and it was kind of weird because I started by writing a novel first, because I wanted to learn more about how to tell a story rather than go dive right in to doing uh, screenplays. And my, my plan was, well, whatever I write as a book, I'm gonna adapt to a screenplay and sell that. Now that hasn't happened yet, but the thing is uh, I abandoned writing any more books. And so I, now I'm exclusively doing screenplays. Uh, and really the best way to start is to read screenplays of movies that you love and that you want to, and more stories about that are similar to the stories that you want to write about. And that is how you learn the specialized format that goes into writing screenplays. It's very, it, 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 there's a, a narrow range of formatting options you can use. Um, and the best way to do that is to, uh, is to read them read great screenplays. I mean, there are a lot of bad ones too, but read well, the good wait, ones. I got to jump in. I, I always, uh, just again, on a personal note is um, I, I received two grants from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts for screenwriting. And, mm -hmm. you know, they were $5,000 a piece. And I'll tell you, they were, the money was, uh, it came at an opportune time. But after uh, writing screenplays, that's how I was able to write the books, the articles, the emails that got things things done for me. But I always would watch bad movies because I said, <laughs> ah, where did the writer go off the rails here? Where is where is my suspension of disbelief going to be, you know, suspended? Where am, when am I not going to buy this long? So uh, a, a, a screenplay is a beautiful um, piece of art. A great screenplay is 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 to be admired. So what you did in your screenplay, though, Alan, for me. You entertained me, but you educated me. So, so just in, in even your opening of your um, screenplay, we have the character of George Field interrogating a German prisoner of war. And just maybe we should just give some uh, background to uh, the people on the call that the Ritchie boys were yeah. immigrants. Many of them were Jewish who well, were- actually. Actually, not many, but a good amount of them. Yeah. Okay. They were, they, were, they were brought to America, enlisted in the army. They were made U.S. citizens because of yeah. their enlistment. Okay. So that's how your father became a U.S. citizen. 
sent to Camp Ritchie in Maryland and trained to be interrogators. Yes, the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, the precursor to the CIA, was the one that, that tr actually trained these guys. And yes, and, and, it, and it was done in Camp Ritchie in rural Maryland, in the, uh, in the mountains, in the rural part of the state, uh, because it was top secret. And uh, they did, a, I think, well, I mean, I don't want to, the last one we did, uh, the author explained the different things that they did to how they trained. Right, right, right. Yeah. But one, one point I want to make out is when we're kids and we're reading uh, books, they begin uh, once upon a time, linear story, and they all end and they lived happily ever after. But you yeah. have tools in screenwriting that Aesop didn't have, or the guy sitting around the campfire telling a story. So at the beginning, when your father is interrogating a German prisoner, and the German prisoner realizes that your father is Austrian, you know, he kind of mocks at him, but here's what you do, you pull back, and we see that your dad is in his training, and that he lost his cool because the fake German prisoner, who's really an American, uh, yeah. playing a Thank character. You. Yeah, yeah. I, I always loved Mission Impossible as a kid, so I, I always love those scenarios where they, I mean, you saw on the script there was another situation where they made a guy, they, they had one of the guys dress up as a, a Russian, a, a Soviet commissar right. to scare the Nazi guy into confessing. Beautiful, yeah. So that would have been your... A ruse. Yes, yeah. for lack of a better term, your, your father's co-worker who came to the States when he was 11 years old, I believe, or in the dialogue, you made that well, 11 years old, yeah. 12 or whatever there. So there was creative license in that part of the I, Oh, I understand that, but, and, yeah. and you have to do that to, yeah. you know, to keep the story entertaining and give us pivot points. Um, one of the things that a screenwriter has to think about is their transitions, right? And you had some amazing transitions. Your father was, um, there's a scene when he's just looking at the, the rifle rack, he's never touched a gun, never held a gun, and he's now an right. army, he's a soldier. And even though he's gonna be in this special group, he has to understand um, uh, the weaponry. And- um, he, he earned when, a sharpshooter badge too. That wasn't brought out in the story, but I mean, that was a small, I mean, you know, a guy who never held a gun in his life because he, he learned the way the army wanted him to learn. Right. Where these guys who grew up with guns on the farm or wherever, you know, they they learned they, they had old habits that they had to break. Absolutely, absolutely. That's but there's some happened. there's some scene in when did, when did your father shoot somebody with his pistol? Well, again, again, dramatic license. No, it wasn't. He didn't. Well, he shot the tire. Yes, yes. He, shot tire. Right. he didn't actually kill. He never killed anybody. Right. So, OK. But do, wait, just to go back here, and I, uh, I don't want me to jump because you did a, you, you structured your story uh, perfectly. One of the things I learned was when your father was in, what was it called, protective custody at, at Dachau? Well, that's what they called it, yes. That's what they called it. But at that time, prisoner, yeah. Yeah, this is before the Germans decided the. Uh, before the they invaded was, Poland. Yeah, it was before, it was the year before, yeah. Okay, so so he, but you were able to get out. If you had uh, a place to go, if there was somebody that was going to accept you, and so your father was the part about having the scholarship. Was that was that true? Or that was, was that everything up, leading up to his uh, enlistment was absolutely true. All those flashbacks, and at the end too, everything was re exactly as as he had relayed it. Right. To me. And, and I guess I, I would have thought that a hey, once the Germans got you is that's it. But well, that wasn't the case. Your father was able there to. There was an opera. Yeah. You had to have a sponsor. You had right. to have somebody. Right. And, and also a great there's the, the term of like the, uh, the setup and the payoff. So your father was a tailor. Was he trained as a tailor? That's, that was also true. Yeah. He worked for a tailor. That's he was arrested on Crystal Night. The, the, yes. You know, the, and he's working for a tailor that night. I and mean, that was absolutely right out of exactly. And, as and by the way, how you share his arrest with the beautiful flashback. So he's in the army and they're, they're, they're presenting in um, the, the brown shirts, fellas dressed up as Nazis. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. It was a fake. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, a mock 
a Nazi rally, Nazi yeah. rally. And, and your father's like, I got to get outside and get some air. And that's when he has this flashback about his boss, the tailor, sends him to yeah. pick up material. And at that evening, he gets arrested. Uh, a German guy throws a, a, a bottle or stick in the uh, spokes of his tire. And, uh, and then, he, as you recall, um, when he's in the concentration camp, he got in trouble. Because he yes. he knitted towels together to keep to, people you know, warm. To keep people warm, yeah. But but the one thing that the setup and the, what your payoff was, which was which was brilliant, was uh, he was told that if you're going to interrogate a German, you have to be equal rank or above. And your father was was taking off um, you know, ranks patches and sewing them back on. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's what they did. You know, there was a whole. Um, I did a lot of research at the National Archives. I lived nearby, near the College Park in Maryland, and and there was a um, a primer in the files that the, that I used that exactly exactly those words that I used in the screenplay. It was all broken out. You know, this is how you get to the Nazis. They love uh, the stamp. They love you know they love administration. They, right. they, and the, and ego and, and all this. This, all these different things. It was all laid out. You know, just from watching documentaries or movies, I, I understand. And, you know, I have an interest in um, uh, the Germans' interest in art, the art that they stole. I've, I've seen all of Vermeer paintings in the world. And, yeah, Hitler, there's lots of Hitler good both bought a Vermeer and stole a Vermeer. But yeah. in the Louvre Museum in, in Paris, uh, a painting called The Astronomer that... Uh, Hitler's crew stole from the Rothschilds. They have the, the Nazi uh, symbol is back with. They were rarely detailed and when they stole all this art uh, um, in Europe. In fact, on an ironic note, I just saw where uh, one of my friends sent me an article about a Van Gogh painting that had been stolen by the Nazis is going up for auction. So the rightful owners, or there gonna be some, um, some split there. So, um, you know, when you ended your screenplay, right? So your father, well, let me back up a second here. So you you taught me something that uh, there were people able to get out of these concentration camps up to a certain period of time. Before the, other the war thing, started, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The other thing that I always wondered about was the Battle of the Bulge. Like how could military intelligence not know well, the, the, the Germans were putting all those men and all that machinery together. It was a mili it was an intelligence disaster. It was a failure. It was an intelligence failure, unfortunately. Because the your father and his colleagues, they were interrogating Germans who were telling them. The no one Germans was there were, to connect the dots. They were always always getting these these they were saying, Oh, I, I we're amassing we're going to this part of uh, an area and no one connected the dots. They couldn't figure it out in time that they were, they were assembling. And, you know, the weather was bad, so they couldn't use air reconnaissance. Right. John so, Eisenhower, Eisenhower book was really good about setting that up. I'd recommend that if you want to know. Wait, whose book is it? John D. Eisenhower's son. Okay. A book about the battle of the budge. Oh. So now something else that happened early in, in your screenplay is that your father changed his name, correct? Yes. And yeah. by doing so, he, he changed his dog tag also? Well, yeah, you, right. Uh, you had either, it was like P for Protestant, C for Catholic, and H yes. for Jewish, Hebrew. Right. And I think you could, yeah, and or it could be nothing. You could take it off. Just and so your father, so your father took his the H off of his yeah. dog. So the, the reason why the reason why that's relevant here is uh, when the Battle of the Bald starts and the Germans come into the what was the name of the town where your father was? Well, it was Blyalf. Blyalf. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So the so the Germans come to town and. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. The Germans come to town and they line up all the um, all the soldiers. Are we okay? Yeah, we're fine. Okay. Well, they line up the soldiers and they go through their dog tags. So oh, your yeah. father's too. That, look, that was an actual event. That actually did happen. Now my father wasn't there. Right. But I kind of Forrest Gumped him for a lot of these things. I made him like at a at the point of history. But that really did happen. There was a there was a yeah, they singled out, they pulled these guys out, 
who didn't change their dog tags. Yes. And uh, they had him shot. Yes. And so your father did not get shot, but obviously right. now, um, and we don't know that um, the, the, the experience that your father had with the uh, commander Bruins who orders the execution, execution of two U.S. soldiers. Right. If that really happened. Yeah, that really happened. I mean, okay. that Bruins was those names. Yeah, he really exists and he was convicted of that. Okay. After the war. That, okay. And so, so you portray the Battle of the Bulge in a way that I never um, thought of or heard of or saw in, in, in a movie or read in a book. So that was. Uh, Meaning uh, uh, that aspect that, of it? That, that your father is about to be, uh, he's wrestling with a German soldier. Oh, yeah. And then, and then there's uh, uh, artillery strike. And then they cut. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that was a little deus machina, I have to I, say. You know, I get the that. Cavalry and, comes in just in time, you know. But uh, I had fun with that. But, but, but it worked. It was, you know, this idea of like suspension of disbelief. There was nothing in there that I said, oh, that was just way too far out there. No, everything, everything oh. clicked. There was nothing wasted in there. Um, one of the great um, transitions is your father was having trouble with um, the physical um, response or physical um, yeah. qualifications of being a soldier, right? right? right. So, he but he also has a brother who is not going to get out. Your uncle was actually a weightlifter. Was he training? That's right. Me? He was. He was. That's right. He was the brawn of the family, and my dad was the brain. Right. And so yep. that, there was, that was a younger brother. Yeah. So so there's some dialogue as there was no Olympic. There were no Olympics in 1940. Right. right. OK. And so but your uncle cannot get uh, out of um, uh, well, that time. There, what was then Israel, which is then Palestine. Palestine. Yeah. He couldn't get out because the Americans said he had no. What was oh, that yeah, term? that was the thing. That was one thing that used the Americans used to keep out immigrants, because if you were a public charge, public charge, if you were either too old or you didn't have a job skill, it was right. It's hard for you to. But, but, but what but what Alan wrote that really worked was um, the brother and um, uh, George have a falling out. George is leaving for St. Louis, where his uncle yeah. is. And so he had somebody to vouch for him in the States. And um, they have this falling out, and but um, George is ready to leave, and his brother shows up at the dock, and you know he gives him a bear hug to his little brother, and there's a great edit where George is back in training, and he's breaking the bear hug of uh, you know a training officer uh, on a wrestling move. So again, that's that that's the things in a screenplay that really jump out at me. Yeah, transitions. Uh I really try to work on transitions and visual transitions. That's important. Well, so I, you know, there's 26 different things a screenwriter has to think about. And yeah. Transitions are, oh uh, are, are one of them. So um, in any event, so now you have the screenplay done and um, uh, you, you know, um, your ending though, I don't know that you're going to keep, so you're, you share what your ending is in the script. Well, it's just that he um, he reunites with his uh, sister, who he thought was dead. Uh, he come his his unit, uh, which actually this did happen. He did really come across this. Really did happen. His unit in Czechoslovakia during the closing days of the war came across a a small group of emaciated women who were the victims of this death march. They were like holed up in some factory somewhere in Solari, Czechoslovakia. That's also documented. And so he had to deal with these, uh, you know, get these women, you know, getting these women back to help and help, help and, and also filing reports and stuff about it. Very right. emotional. Right. So, um, so your screenplay's finished. And I, again, I, uh, I enjoyed reading and I'm glad you shared it with me. And just for the record, when I started writing screenplays, I had to get the Smith Corona electric typewriter out. And from the screenplay that an agent from William Morris had sent me a screenplay where everything goes on the page. But now we have software to do that. We have final Thank goodness. Draft. I could never have done it without. without oh, it, 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 it faded. Well, I always say technology is the writer's friend, but it's the writer's foe. Because while you should be writing, you may minimize your screen and go on YouTube and 
you know, well, little videos of, of dogs. I'm thinking, I'm thinking it allows many more people who to get to get in the game <laughs> because it used to be you had to, you know, you had to have a typewriter and not many people wrote screenplays, but now anyone could write one. Oh, and, and again, and it's something you you're the, the best screenwriters uh, of all time are self-taught. You know, the examples I use, uh, uh, Patty Chayefsky won three oh, I love Academy it. Awards. He's my uh, a screenwriter. Ne never, never one day set foot into a screenwriting class. The greatest screenplay I've ever read, and I've read it many times, On the Waterfront, Bud Schulberg never went to screenwriting yeah, class. And then too. the best one, mm -hmm. William Goldman, who wrote numerous screenplays, didn't see a screenplay till he was 34 years old. So... Right, but he was a novelist. I think he was a novelist first. Right? He, yeah. he wrote one of my favorite. He wrote the novel that ended up being one of my favorite unheard of movies called A Soldier in the Rain with the unlikely cast of Jackie Gleason and Steve McQueen. I never knew that. I recommend it to everybody. A Soldier in the Rain is one of the coldest movies. And Tuesday Weld's in it also, so worth watching. So, Ellen, what are you going to do with your screenplay now? I am looking to get it produced. Um, I'm, you know, I'm entering it into contests, hoping to get some street cred, and um, you know, I'm just talking it up, trying to, you know, I post, I posted the it on Facebook and the uh, Richie Boys of World War II uh, Facebook group, and I'm getting some, you know, there was this woman out in LA who was like a said she knew she wasn't in the film business, but she knew someone who was. So people come out of the woodwork, and like yourself, yeah. you like, you know, you, you liked it as well. Um, yeah, it's promising, and I just wrote this thing, and this year in May, I mean, it came together. It, it, I we talked about this having a good outline is critical, you know, for most screen. For screenwriters, I mean, you have to have a really detailed outline so that your screenplay, when you write the screenplay, it's easy. I, I say 10 times as much time on your outline yeah. as on the screenplay, oh, yeah. as on the screenplay itself. But there's so many, uh, you know, things that you need to, uh, all the things that you did, the uh, setup and the payoff, the foreshadowing, you know, everything worked in there. And you have no wasted, wasted scenes there. So I really anyway, appreciate Appreciate Listen. It. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Okay, you're 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 welcome. I'm I'm glad I had the chance to read it. So uh, hopefully now the people on the call maybe are thinking, hey, you know what? I should start writing. And what I tell people, the first thing you need to do, you need to um, set up your creative time. Block off time every week, Saturday morning, eight to twelve, and Sunday from one to five or whatever. And that's, that's gotta be your creative time. And uh, I'm a weekend writer. Um, you know, I, I deal with my clients sometimes on the weekend, but that's my, my creative time. Um, just show of hands. Um, anybody on here working on anything in, in the writing genre, anybody, um, you know, taking pen to paper, ah, Rich, Rick. Okay. We know that you're doing your, uh, uh, book. Um, anybody else? Nope. Well, everybody's got a story, so I think uh, we should all, you know, try to express them. So in any event, I'm going to close off by just sharing this. I mean, uh, as I started the show, writing has been cathartic to me. It got I me just got, um, yeah, I think I was muted. Oh, Bob, sorry. You hear Bob Riley? Yes. This, this, is, this is monumental right now. You, you're experiencing history. This is my first Zoom <laughs> audio, video. Yeah. It, you know, I signed in as, yeah, <laughs> I, I like that. I mean, what's that song? Raise it up. Raise it up. Yes. Time is here. Come on. Yes. I mean, I signed on at seven o'clock, hoping to catch my really good friend, Richard Sand. Ah. Right, see my hat? Yes. I think I missed it. But the hour was worth it because I got the heck in and you were still live. And son of a gun, I even got the audio. I tried to talk and I thought, they're not hearing me. I got a lot to say, but it's too late. I know. I'll get you next time, though. And I got well, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you I'm very glad much. Here. If Richard's your friend, you can just call him tomorrow and have uh, go to the Melrose Diner and have breakfast with him down there in South Philly. Oh, you've been there then. 
I've been to Philly so many times. I I love the city. Yeah, I next love the time, city. give give me a holler. I'll meet you there. I'm from Philly, oh, you're buying right the first one. Yeah, absolutely, it'll, it'll, so. just, it'll just, just watch, it'll watch, watch, watch. The mafia is not there to hurry. And if you do get there, just go under the table. If you hear something, <laughs> click. <laughs> if you, well, wait, Bob. So um, you know Richard, you said, but um, were you were you're you're a veteran yourself? I'm a Vietnam veteran. Okay. Yeah, and I got all the uh, all the things that uh, normal with Vietnam veterans that were I was on a DMZ supporting the uh, third and first Marine Division. I was in a little artillery battery one mile from the DMZ. I guess we overwatched the uh, seventy three of us. We watched uh, two hundred thousand across the Ben Hay River. Somehow I got through it. Got everything that uh, you know PTSD. Uh, you know, bilateral hearing loss, major depressive disorder, bipolar, uh, heart problems, Agent Orange, uh, diabetes. Well, they say two, but I, I think it's four. It must be double the uh, aggravation. Yet, as long as I can stay engaged in helping another veteran, I also found if I can stay engaged helping anybody, like last month, I spent two weeks on Kensington Avenue. Water, pretzels, socks, tooth, toothbrushes. Hell, some of them took a basket, two basketballs, two Bibles, uh, toy guitars, toy harmonicas, and they got needles in their arms. That is healing. But guess what down there? It's loveless but there is some love and those that can get there and, and courageously, it takes a lot of courage to, to get there. I, but I went like uh, over two weeks, 250 I ministered to, I do that. That day I'm healed. That day, no demons come. There's no flashbacks or anything. I am, I ride high. Uh, and today I was at Edison high school, second in Luzerne, the replacement high school, for the Edison 64. And uh, I'm working on, uh, actually, I should get an email from the junior ROTC program. There's 40 cadets there, inner city. And I landed two classes. <laughs> I mean, I am so high right now, naturally. And I'm so, look, I prepared for it so long. And I'll teach a course custom about love. Number two, I'm going to be teaching a course about the Edison 64, a 45 minute segment on who the F they were, not how they got there, not why they died, not that they signed up and got because they got off, off the street for gangs, who were each of the 64. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I love them like brothers from the same mother. I've lived with them for five years since I protested the demolition of the 8th and Lehigh original one. And they saved the part. 64 homeless veterans moved in a year ago. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. And uh, so I'm teaching a course. This will be initially to the junior ROTC, six a week. Who were they? And I've done all the research. I, I, I've gotten pretty good, except I couldn't Zoom till today. I was good searching. I got, I had a course from a uh, Skip Tracer federal marshal on how to connect and find people. <laughs> well, that's, that's a yeah. good teacher. That would be a good I teacher. I know them, and I'm going to yes. teach it because they don't know them, but they need to know them. Not only do they need to know them, the cadets, 500 in that high school need to know them. And I would like then someday to come here and teach the world. Well, let me just say this. And why they did what they did. Your, your spirit is infectious. I am so Thank glad you, that sir. I'm so glad that I was on the. Is that Ken? Yes, I am Ken. Ken. I'm so glad that you're, um, um, by the way, in my other office, I have a photograph of uh, myself in front of Rocky's house in Kensington. In the Kensington oh, area, yeah. that's where Rocky lived. Yes, but um, by the way, I know that Ellie just posted that um, 
uh, I think in the BBC magazine, there was an excerpt from Richard's book on Edison 64. Well, you have the book, you know the book, of oh, course. I have the book. And also, <laughs> do, do, you, do you have, do you know this group in Philadelphia called Warrior Writers? I do not. Oh, you got to look them up. I know they're, they're a group and they, um, shoot, um, Warrior Writers, it's connected to the uh, Philadelphia Culture, Cultural Trust. I believe, um, Bob, you know, if we, if we could trade phone numbers, I have information yeah. on this organization, but- Okay, I'll um, give you mine right now. Is that good? Uh, please. Yeah, 856-372-0382. Okay. Got it. 0333, Bob okay. Riley, R-E-I-L-L-Y. I had sent last week, coincidentally, is how I hooked up with BBC, although I was connected before on the mailing list, to Todd. And I sent him a, a song I wrote. I sent him 200, uh, I sent him 77 original quotes that were published in General Satterfield's blog a while back, Vietnam Vet Quotes. If you ever go to theleadermaker.com, you'll see introduction, you know, about, it's about me, but it's not, because nothing I've done in recovery is Bob Riley originated. When I used to originate shit before, I effed it all up. And I, I did it, I worked too long or too short or I drank too much or too little or I got too angry or too sad. At some point I connected to he who made me and he inspires me to do what I do. But yet they say Bob Riley, it's really what I wrote in those quotations, which, which he loved. General Satter, he put it out to his quarter of a million blogger receivers, which I got it in an email. I'm okay with emails. Blogging, I'm not sure. Facebook, I'm not sure. I can look at everybody else's, but if you look at mine, you'll probably see a blank screen <laughs> right now. But oh, I'm you know what? That's, yeah, listen. No, this is great. This, no, is this, is, this is great because the phrase that I overuse is train your brain to think like a writer. A writer has to think a certain way. And maybe if you get that focus, you know, uh, you'll be back on here talking about the book you wrote. Who is General Satterfield for my own education? Oh, General that? Douglas Satterfield, 25-year uh, U.S. Army veteran. He, he came up initially in the enlisted ranks, uh, then went to uh, OCS, uh, became a one-star general and uh, have three tours in Iraq. And uh, his last tour, he, he was, at that point, I guess he was general status, commanded 12,000 soldiers, and they rebuilt Iraq, well, every year for five years. <laughs> you know, <laughs> General Satterfield has a blog theleadermaker.com. And if you go there every day, every day for, for eight years, he, he blogs out one page, tips about being a great, great leader. In fact, one of my unit members wrote a book and I, and I sent it to him. I says, oh, I said, this was my uh, second lieutenant. I mean, he, he saved 72 lives one night. And uh, what do you think of it, General? Just give me your, your, your comment. So he did the review and it was, uh, you know, it was wonderful. And the general says, geez, Dennis, I wish I could write a book. I've been wanting to do that for, you know, for many years. And I sent a sentence back to him and I said, General, you, you, had, you blogged 3,000 times, one page, 3,000, you have 10 books. Just go back to the beginning and go. And literally, he just published last week the longest year in Iraq by retired General Douglas Satterfield. A month ago, it was on Kindle. Now it's on paperback. He has his first signing, coincidentally, Atlantic City this week. I just invited him to a car show that I'm, I have a table 
benefiting Vietnam veterans with Agent Orange issues, and I give out my songs, you know, I've given around 4,000. I've never charged anybody. I gave out 4,000 so far. I give out, give out the songs. I have a project, Love. You know, I'll teach it to you right now. Because well, before you, you know do that, is. before you do that, you know, we, we kind of have a hard out at 8.30. I promised the uh, okay. BBC Just look that. Here. But Can please. you see it? Yes. You know what that is? I know. I, you I, have to know it. It's I love you. It's sign language. Oh, yes, yes, you yes. Need, you need, everyone needs to know that. Because everybody, 99 don't know it, but everybody knows this one. How is it? Everybody knows what that stands for, but one out of a hundred know this. Okay. That's, that's one of the courses I'm teaching next week. Bob, I can't think of a better way to end this call. Thank you for being here. Thank you everybody for being uh, on the call. You. And um, I bless listen, you all there. This I think I, I saw somebody reacting or laughing at me. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> They're not laughing at you, my friend. They're laughing with, with you. Me, yeah. They're laughing with you. <laughs> if I, I get a kick out of myself. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank uh, you. Hope to see you soon.